Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, reflection for today, day 17, uh, the crowd that needed challenging the uh, title for today, the crowd that needed challenging from Luke 14, 25 to 33. I think I heard sermons on these verses at least once a year when I was a teenager, and they appeared in many of the books I read. Whether they were biographies of Christian heroes or books of teaching on the Christian life, taking up the cross, counting the cost, making sacrifices, being willing to suffer, these were frequently repeated themes. When I left high school, one of the few openly Christian teachers gave me Dietrich Bonhoeffer's famous book, The Cost of Discipleship. Who could forget its most famous sentence? When Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. But I can't remember when I last heard a sermon on chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. Books on the cost of discipleship appear infrequently, perhaps once in a blue moon. At the same time as the years have passed, only a minority of books have focused on the meaning of the cross for the Lord Jesus or its significance for us. Do you think perhaps that these two things stand or fall together? There is certainly a lot of talk about discipleship, but not so much about the meaning of Jesus' death or about carrying the cross. There seems to be more emphasis on being taught than sacrificing, on doing rather than suffering, on knowing how to order your life better rather than being willing to go anywhere and do anything for Christ. That, after all, is at first glance, and maybe tenth glance too, a more attractive message. It's likely to draw more people into the Christian crowd. At this point on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus himself was being followed by great crowds, at times numbering thousands. Luke 12 verse 1. We tend to be much more impressed by crowds than Jesus was. He made it clear that his focus was not on the number of his followers, but on whether that number followed him without reservations. <clears throat> and here, he makes it crystal clear what that means. In fact, he explains the sine qua non, the essential condition for being a Christian. Without this, a person cannot be my disciple. 14 verses 26, 27 and 33. The principle he lays down is this, following him must have absolute priority in your life. In fact, if you don't hate father, mother, wife, children or, and your own life, you cannot be his disciple. Notice that Jesus isn't saying that without this radical commitment, you can still be a decent but not really a great disciple. He says that you can't be a disciple at all. And if you have heard people say that hate here simply means love less, forget it. <clears throat> it's much more radical than that. What Jesus is saying is that by comparison with your devotion to him, all other loves must seem like hate. And that includes your natural love for yourself. He is calling us to die to everything we count dear in our lives. This is why he went on to talk about taking up the cross and following him. After his death, those words must have come back to the disciples with overwhelming force. He was asking them to be willing to do what he would first do for them. If this is the case, no wonder that we need to sit down and count the cost because unless I am willing to have my whole life first deconstructed and then reconstructed by Jesus, I will never be his disciple. <clears throat> Once again, Jesus makes clear that following him, becoming a disciple, being a Christian, is an all or nothing business.
a really challenging uh, reflection for us this morning. Uh, the reflection uh, time for us, have you given yourself to Jesus? Only if you have, will you be able to give up anything for Jesus? How do we see Jesus demonstrating this same cross-shaped commitment to us? So a few moments to reflect together. Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to be faithful, to be faithful disciples. Help us to know what it means to be willing to follow you faithfully. Lord, there is a cost to discipleship. But Lord, help us firstly to be able to see why that is worth it, why following you is worth it. And then secondly, Help us to trust you and help us to make wise decisions in our lives. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, thank you all very much for joining me once again this morning. Uh, we meet again tomorrow at half past nine for The Grumblers from Luke 15, verses 1 to 2 and 11 to 32. Uh, the Grumblers. Uh, that's tomorrow. Take care, everybody. All the best. Bye for now.